As Frank said, I'm Roy Capani, and I'm a trustee here at the Meridian Center. I'm also the chairman and CEO of C Corp, and uh, C Corp has been uh, working uh, closely with the Navy for over 40 years on building out sensors and uh, technology that they use uh, on the submarines and uh, surface ships. So I have the honor of introducing the session on ocean diplomacy, and uh, I wish we had uh, enough time to do an entire session uh, 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 on uh, maritime issues because there's no shortage um, of uh, items on that topic. From an economic perspective, 90% of the traded goods uh, carried over the w are carried over the waves, and maritime trade volumes are set to triple by 2050. We've all seen how fragile the supply chain can be with recent bottlenecks off the coast of California and elsewhere. From a security standpoint, we could delve into the South China Sea and where U.S. Admiral John Aquilino recently shared that China has fully militarized three artificial islands, and we could discuss the importance of the Black Sea to both Russia, Ukraine, and the, uh, in, in that global crisis. It also bears mentioning that critical undersea infrastructure literally links the continents, and this infrastructure requires protection. The oceans of the world uh, contain critical infrastructure for power distribution, energy production, and the worldwide high-speed data transmission networks that we all depend on. It's important to know that the cloud in cloud computing is really under the ocean and not the sky. Satellites at this time cannot match the cost, speed, and data bandwidth advantages provided by the undersea cables. Uh, I, once, I recently had the opportunity to take a look at a cable map, and if you ever have a chance, go out and take a look at the, uh, do a Google search on that and see what the cable maps look like and it is, it's, it's just incredible to see how uh, the world's oceans uh, have turned into superhighways for data traffic. Another topic could cover deep sea mining. In a quest to search for the rare earth minerals that are all too important to the development of advanced technologies and is so critical to the supply chain of electronic manufacturing industry. Um, but this forum is on diplomacy and international affairs and uh, its focus is how we work together in international waters. As land tends to divide the world, we could see our oceans and waterways and ocean infrastructures as a unifying force. Back in February, French President Emmanuel Macron uh, convened, convened the o One Ocean Summit to build a coalition around a high seas treaty to protect marine life, and we're about to hear from His Excellency Ambassador Lazarus Amayo of the Republic of Kenya about the first UN Ocean Conference in over five years that's going to take place this summer. Today we're going to hear about the role of marine scientists in science, in science diplomacy and fostering international cooperation. We're fortunate that our featured speaker for this discussion is one of the State Department's top officials overseeing the ocean diplomacy portfolio. J.R. Littlejohn is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. She's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service. Uh, most recently serving as the Deputy Director, of, uh, uh, Deputy Director of Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's Office of Policy Planning. I understand that we have some HBCU uh, students online today, so it's worth mentioning that while Ms. Littlejohn holds a master's degree from the National Defense University and Columbia University, she first got her bachelor's degree at Morgan State University. And with that, I'd like to welcome Pete S. Littlejohn to the podium. Thank you, Roy. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. One might say you know you've made it when you've been invited uh, here to speak at the Meridian House. It is known, quite frankly, as one of Washington's and probably one of the country's greatest treasures. I am also humbled to be in the company of such a distinguished panel, including, of course, Ambassador Negroponte, our former Deputy Secretary of State. Some of you might not know this, but Ambassador Negroponte served as the Assistant Secretary for Environment, Oceans, and Fisheries in the 1980s, and he was instrumental in negotiating the Montreal Protocol, one of the most successful environmental treaties of our time. It is inspiring to see his continued dedication to such important issues nearly four decades ago, sir. Very good to see you. And Ambassador, I'm also happy to report that the Bureau you once led, um, now called the Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs Bureau, or OES, or as I tell my family, the Bureau that works every day to save the planet, um, your legacy is carrying on, 
and leading in multilateral fora on environmental issues. In fact, uh, beginning in March, countries at the UN Environmental Assembly, or UNEA 5.2, adopted a resolution entitled End Plastic Pollution Towards an International Legally Binding Instrument. This resolution launches the negotiations on a global agreement on plastic pollution, addressing the full life cycle of plastic. It was hailed as the most important step forward on the environment since the Paris Agreement. We are here today to talk about our ocean and blue economy, but I think the real question is what kind of ocean will we leave to our children and grandchildren if we continue on the current trajectory? Frankly, we dump about a truckload of plastic into our oceans every single minute of every single day. And for those of you that are counting, that's up to about 14 million tons of plastic a year. This <clears throat> this is why Assistant Secretary Monica Medina and our dedicated negotiating team at OES are working day after day after day to get us a legally binding agreement by the end of 2024 that will address the scourge of plastic pollution. The year 2022 truly is, as I think Assistant Secretary Medina often likes to say, a super year for the ocean. And we need, no doubt, a super year. The ocean sustains all life on Earth, regulates climate and weather, generates half of the planet's oxygen, and provides food and livelihoods for billions of people around the world. Now, I talked about the scourge of plastic pollution in our ocean, but the health of the ocean is also under constant attack from many other stressors, including greenhouse gas emissions, overfishing, rising temperatures, and acidification, to name a few. And these pressures are compounded by a lack of adequate ocean governance. Our current actions are leading to a result that none of us can bear, an ocean that one day could become barren of resources and life. And I'm certain this is not a future that we want, but it is the future that we will get if we don't take decisive action now. Thankfully, ocean issues are starting to be featured more prominently on the world stage and we are seeing some major strides forward as a result. The UN Environment Assembly uh, resolution on plastic that I mentioned earlier means countries can no longer ignore plastic pollution and will have to negotiate a way to address the full lifestyle of life cycle of plastics. And we have also had recent success with constructive negotiations on a new global agreement on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction or the BBNJ as it is known. When we talk about the BBNJ, we are talking about the high seas, which is about two thirds of the world's oceans, reaching the depths of over 10,000 kilometers and representing 95% of the Earth's total habitat by volume. Last year, the United States announced it is joining the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, known as the Ocean Panel. And this week, we are co-hosting the Our Ocean Conference together with Palau, in Palau, which is where Assistant Secretary Medina is right now, alongside Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. There, more than 80 government and 100 non-governmental de delegations are at our ocean. And we anticipate the announcement of hundreds of commitments by the end of the conference worth billions of dollars. The State Department launched the first Our Ocean Conference back in 2014, and since then we have seen more than 1,400 commitments worth more than $90 billion from stakeholders around the world to protect the ocean. Now, after our ocean, we look forward to continuing the momentum right into the UN Con Ocean Conference in Portugal in June. And I want to thank Ambassador Amayo, who I don't see right now, but Ambassador Amayo, who is one of the distinguished panelists today, oh, back there, <laughs> uh, for Kenya's leadership co hosting the UN Conference. Your Excellency, as you know, Assistant Secretary Medina recently visited Kenya and was struck by your country's environmental leadership on so many fronts, from banning plastic bags to marine conservation. 
We look forward to many great things coming out of the meeting in Lisbon. And then it will already be time for us to start thinking about how we're going to be preparing and getting ready for Cairo and COP27 in November. Now I'd like to spend just a few minutes describing um, some additional areas of focus for the United States in the months that remain in this super year of the ocean. First, marine protected areas or MPAs. Well-managed MPAs provide invaluable ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration and coastal protection and resilience. They are also economic engines that support fishing, tourism, and recreation. In the United States, we are implementing a presidential directive to achieve the goal of conserving at least 30% of our land and waters by 2030. And it bears noting that this was one of the first things that President Biden did when he came into office. And we fully support conserving our protecting or protecting 30% of the global ocean by 2030. We are encouraging other countries to commit to doing so as well. Of course, we know it's difficult, especially for developing states, to manage and enforce MPAs and to say no to financial support that comes from extractive activities. We need to work together to find incentives that help support the durability of conservation efforts, including new management measures and sustainable finance mechanisms like blue bonds. These will help countries weather hard times without unraveling years of hard work to protect marine areas. I'd also like to highlight the visionary efforts of Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Panama to create the Eastern Tropical Marine Corridor, or CMAR. At over a half a million square kilometers, CMAR is expected to be one of the largest sustainably managed corridors connecting marine protected areas in the world. Now I'll move on to the BBNJ, which I mentioned earlier. The new BBNJ agreement will also be critical to achieving our 30 by 30 goal for the global ocean by creating, for the first time, an effective, coordinated, and cross-sectoral approach to establishing marine protected areas on the high seas. A fifth BBNJ negotiation will be held in August. The United States, along with nearly every other country, is committed to a strong and effective BBNJ agreement. We are working hard to finalize negotiations at the August session. Another area um, that is a priority for us this year is combating illegal, unreported, and unregulated, or IUU fishing. IUU fishing jeopardizes maritime security and livelihoods for law-abiding fishers and communities. It is also something that threatens our ocean ecosystems and destabilizes vulnerable coastal states. We need to ensure sustainable fishing, to improve livelihoods, and to empower women and men who depend on it for its vital resources. The United States has long been a leader in promoting sustainable fisheries through effective, science-based, sustainable approaches to fisheries management and cooperative tools to combat IUU fishing, such as the groundbreaking Port State Measures Agreement. Under the Maritime Security and Fisheries Act, Enforcement Act, we are mobilizing a coordinated whole of government approach to counter IUU fishing and also the related threats to maritime security in priority regions and priority flag states around the world. Still, there is an urgent need to do more. Too many bad actors are able to exploit loopholes, evade detection, and get their illegal catch into the market. We need to leverage creative new lines of effort, particularly to build new partnerships that make greater transparency the norm. Transparency and data sharing are essential to understand the full complexity of IUU fishing, both in the high seas and in inclusive economic zones, and to target the owners who profit from breaking the rules. This shared data can also be a force multiplier to address other challenges such as forced labor, safety at sea, and mitigating and adapting to climate disruptions. Finally, let me stress that the climate crisis is also an ocean crisis. Tackling the climate crisis is a high priority for the United States. 
and is critical to protecting the ocean and coastal communities that rely on it. The United States is committed to advancing ocean-based solutions, such as scaling up offshore renewable energy and protecting and restoring coastal and ocean ecosystems that store carbon and protect coastlines from climate impacts. We also need to work together to decarbonize the shipping sector. Emissions from shipping are significant and rising. They are not on a trajectory consistent with achieving the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. And if the shipping sector were a country, it would probably be the eighth largest emitter. This is why the United States has committed to work with countries in the International Maritime Organization to achieve zero greenhouse gas emissions from international shipping no later than 2050. Now, as you can tell, I could probably go on because this issue set is vast. But I hope I have made clear that the United States is using every single tool in our kit in the blue diplomacy toolbox to advance the policies and partnerships needed to address the 21st century stressors to our ocean and planet. The time for action is now, and we are prepared to work with all partners and stakeholders to make sure this is, in fact, a super year for the ocean. Thank you. Well, PDAS, Little John, welcome to Meridian House. Thank you. Um, I really did appreciate uh, your, uh, your talk on the issues. There are vast, and uh, we wanted to have a, an opportunity to get some questions uh, asked from the, from the audience. So uh, if we've got uh, some questions. Hi, I have some questions from the virtual audience online. Um, for you, Ms. Littlejohn, it's a two-parter. Um, what is the U.S.'s position on the new agreement to end plastic pollutions? And uh, what is the U.S. policy on sea level rise shrinking the maritime zones of island nations? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll start with the first question. I think the best way to answer that is to go back to a comment I made in my remarks, which I thought kind of says a lot of why we're working so hard to address uh, the scourge of plastic pollution in our oceans. I mentioned that somewhere in the neighborhood of between 8 and 14 million tons of garbage or trash are dumped, plastics, are dumped into our oceans around the world. That's an estimation. And that, again, equals about a truckload of plastics dumped every minute of every single day. And if we think about it, um, plastics have maybe a brief period or a brief life cycle, 12 minutes or so, but they live for centuries in our oceans. They can be found everywhere, whether it's in the belly of an animal in Antarctica to the highest heights of the Himalayas, to the deepest depths of the ocean, and there they remain. And so there are great uses and important uses of plastics. We cannot deny that. But there are significant trade-offs in using those materials. And that's why I'm really um, happy that so many countries, in fact, 175, I think, is the number, and some of the negotiators are actually in the room, um, were a party and adopted the uh, resolution at the UN Environmental Assembly um, to launch negotiations on an agreement that will allow us to sort of end the scourge of plastic pollutions for hopefully ever, uh, or at least the foreseeable future. But it will take time. Those negotiations will take at least another two years. The goal is to have it wrapped up by 2024 and to produce something that is ambitious and innovative and country driven. Um, And I would say that there are probably maybe two takeaways uh, from that. And the first I would say is that no country can do it alone, right? These are global problems that will require global international solutions. And um, the second I would say is that 
while they can't do them alone, we have to do them in partnership, working with others and using the tools at our disposal. And one example of that is that the National Act Plan or the agreements are multi-stakeholder agreements. And so that will allow for us to reach out and work in partnership with private sector and academia and others. We have to leverage all of the resources and tools we have available to us to resolve the issue. Um, and I think you asked a second question uh, about sea level. Um, I would say on sea level rise in island nations, we all know that that this is a significant threat to the livelihoods of so many people. It affects uh, the maritime zones, and in particular, the um, EEZs, or exclusive economic zones, that the populations, particularly uh, island states, um, island nations, and uh, coastal communities depend on for their livelihoods, um, for their food. And so we have to work more collectively to try to find ways to address the maritime concerns that are also in line with international legal norms and responsibilities. I think that's what I would say. Yes, little John, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I think that's it for our, our question period, right? And so, all right, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sharon Weinberger. I'm the National Security Editor at the Wall Street Journal. It's a great pleasure to be in person after two years, but an even greater pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have His Excellency Lazarus Amayo, the Ambassador of Kenya to the United States. If you would like to take a seat. Um, and then we have Ambassador John Negroponte, currently the Vice Chair of McLarty Associates. And we have Dr. Larry Mayer, uh, Chair of the U.S. National Committee for the U.N. Decade of Ocean Science. Um, so I wanted to start off by opening up with a general question to our panelists that any of you can chime in on. Um, beyond the UN Law of the Sea Convention, we have another possible maritime treaty on our horizon, the so-called High Seas Treaty for, mar for Marine Conservation. Um, would someone like to talk a bit about this treaty? What are the prospects of the U.S. joining it, for example? And that can be to, to any of you. I could start on that one. I'm, sure. I'm, cer I'm certainly not an expert, and I think uh, Pidas uh, Littlejohn spoke quite a bit about it, uh, what we call the BBNJ Treaty, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, and, and presented what, what I heard as a very upbeat picture of the U.S. position on it. Um, it's an interesting uh, treaty because uh, it's being done under the framework of the Law of the Sea Treaty. The Law of the Sea Treaty is a framework treaty, and so this is a, a subset of it, but it came about because when the Law of the Sea Treaty was negotiated in the 1970s, there was so much that was unknown about the ocean. And one of the things that were, was unknown was the nature of marine genetic resources and the whole question of biodiversity in the deep sea. At that time, they thought the deep sea was just a, a blank slate with nothing in it. And so this is the first of what I think will probably be many efforts to, to basically address the new knowledge we've gained since the Law of the Sea Treaty was written uh, and try to frame that in our current understanding. And, and again, I think uh, PDAS's, Little John's comments were, were very, very encouraging in terms of the position of the US with respect to it. I suspect, and I don't know, that one of the few challenging points may be technology transfer and the nature of that. I, I think the US is firm that technology transfer needs to be voluntary and not enforced. I'm gonna guess not having read the draft, <laughs> but I'm going to guess that one of the challenges as compared to uh, domestic, when you have national resource jurisdiction, is going to be enforcement. I don't know. I, I assume it's flag state enforcement, and therein can lie a very big problem. 
Uh, you never know. <laughs> right. What, what are the technology transfer issues? Well, I think this, uh, and, and Ambassador Negroponte addressed this uh, earlier this morning, uh, when the Lava Sea Treaty was initially negotiated, there was a, a very strong statement about technology transfer. In that case, I think it was early technologies about manganese nodule mining and things like that. Um, and this was a sticking point um, with respect to forcing the technology to be transferred. And I think eventually it was resolved. And Ambassador Negroponte can probably address how that was resolved. And I suspect with uh, BBNJ, they're probably more on genetic resources in terms of how those uh, resources are extracted. And I think there's wealth distribution uh, um, or profit distribution issues that are still outstanding too, I suspect. And again, this is not my area of expertise. Sure. I, I look at the mud, not the, not the bugs. <laughs> So Ambassador Negroponte, a question for you. I think it's uh, 167 um, out of 195 independent states and countries are party to the law of the sea treaty, but not the United States, although I believe it upholds many of its conventions. Um, what are the barriers to the US joining it? What are the prospects of the US joining it? If you could address some of those issues. Well, the, you could answer the question in one sentence, which is that uh, it's our inability to get the Senate to ratify the treaty. You need 67 votes for the law of the sea, for any treaty. And uh, what has happened is we've signed it. People were talking this morning about have we, are we signatories? Yes, we're, by all means. And we even observe the provisions of the law of the sea uh, as customary international law. So we're observant of the, we're not, we're not uh, flagrant violators of the, Law of the Sea Convention. But um, well, we had this history of the original treaty was considered too, let's just say in quotes, socialistic, the chapter 11 dealing with uh, deep sea bed mining. But then the international, a miraculous thing happened. I mean, it hardly ever happens in the history of treaties. They came to us and said, we're willing to take another look at this whole thing and renegotiate chapter 11 if you're prepared to come and do that. And we did that, we negotiated it. And, uh, and, and to our own satisfaction, but still we've not been able, long story short, to ratify it. We've submitted it to the Senate a couple of times. It's been voted out of committee at least once to the floor of the Senate. The last effort was in 2012. Um, you know, with current circumstances being the way they are and with China acting in such disregard of some of the most important provisions of the law of the sea, effectively by saying that the South China Sea is a Chinese lake, that's the basic, basically what they've done with their so-called nine dash line. And even a tribunal, an arbitral tribunal of the law of the sea convention has ruled against China and in the favor of the Philippines on this matter. So uh, it seems to me that time might be more propitious for another effort to ratify the law of the sea. It, it needs, it'll get 50 Democrats if it goes to a vote in, in, in the current configuration of the Senate and it needs 17 Republicans. Well, I started working on this issue in 1970 on the staff <laughs> as an NSC staffer uh, for Richard Nixon. And for a short period of time, I was in a policy shop that they had. And it just so happened that at that time, a national security study memorandum came up on the law of the sea. And I sort of chaired a little interagency group. And we wrote the initial instructions for our uh, law of the sea delegation. And um, uh, so we've been trying and hope springs eternal. And, and the, the case is a good case. I think that's the most important thing. We achieved virtually all our objectives and every element of our uh, society, business, uh, the military, the government, uh, all favor uh, moving forward with this agreement. There's been some ideological resistance to the law of the sea, but I don't think it is uh, based on a, a proper assessment of our national interests. Thank you. 
If, if I could just Please. add a comment to that, I've sat on a number of panels discussing uh, this issue, and there were panels with Greenpeace and the American Petroleum Institute representatives, all in agreement. I didn't. I forgot to mention the whole oil and gas, <laughs> the whole oil and gas industry. Yeah. So it, it is remarkable that, uh, that we're not party to that treaty. And these manganese nodules and other precious minerals that are beyond 200 miles. The only way an American company will be able to mine those uh, is by us ratifying the treaty so that an American company can be accredited by the commission of the uh, uh, Law of the Sea that, that recognizes these, uh, uh, these leaseholds. Because if you don't have that recognition, what company is going to take the risk and what insurance company is going to insure a, a, a multi, it's one, two billion dollar investment to go ahead and mine these things, so. Thank you. Ambassador Amayo, um, I believe that uh, the, the UN is scheduled to hold their first ocean conference since 2017, this summer in Lisbon with Kenya as the co-host. Um, uh, I'd like to ask more about this conference, its importance, and, um, and also if you could address ocean diplomacy more largely and, and its importance. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Weinberger. Let me begin by uh, thanking uh, Meridian Diplomatic Forum for the invitation and for organizing this uh, particular meeting. Some of the questions I was supposed to answer, thank God, Madam J.R. Little John has already answered, but uh, I'll go back to where you have asked me to be. Uh, start stating that Kenya as a coastal state has had interest in matters regarding the ocean, leave alone the socioeconomic benefits that we get from it or that we are a gateway to uh, shipping and inland uh, countries inland and, uh, and so Ocean diplomacy becomes important and natural to us in Kenya because the ocean is a shared resource. Its health, its utilization have a direct con consequence to those of us that are coastal states and other users. And that therefore calls for involvement of other state stakeholders, be they member states or non-state actors, for purposes of addressing concerns, as you rightfully pointed out, which have arisen out of utilization and out of the health of the ocean itself. And so uh, Kenya has been active in this line right from the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Our scholars and experts were active in the negotiations and formulation of the UNCLOS itself in 1982. Uh, Kenya, too, uh, had an opportunity of um, negotiating as co-facilitators with Ireland the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 of them with 14, uh, SDG 14 on life underwater being one of our prime uh, areas of interest. But um, the Ocean Conference we're talking about this year is actually the second UN Ocean Conference. The first one was in 2017. And after the first UN Ocean Conference in 2017 that was co-hosted by Sweden and Fiji, Kenya and Japan and Canada hosted the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in 2018 in Nairobi, which in a way also brought into focus the role and attention to be given to activities that happen on land that have ramifications on the oceans. Whether they are rivers or surface, surface runoffs, they have a direct bearing. Attention has been given more to the oceans, but not much on inland waters. And so that particular SCBC brought that into the picture. Now, the other aspect that is of interest to us is that we are also the home of UNEP, United Nations Environment Programme. So activities that are of significance to the global community on matters environment become important to us. And so what I would say is that 
Portugal and Kenya were actually originally supposed to host the second UN Ocean Conference in 2020, but because of the outbreak of COVID, it was postponed. Now we're looking forward to hosting it uh, in Portugal from 27th of June to the 1st of July. And with your permission, I could be allowed to say that this is a forum, a platform that will be able to bring together the stakeholders, member states, and UN agencies, um, civil society, inter uh, 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 and, and NGOs, all organizations that have sought accreditation to be able to participate in looking at what? We made significant commitments, voluntary commitments in 2017 to, re to reverse or improve the health of the ocean. 1,400 such commitments were made. Thereafter, there have been a few more. There are now about almost 1,600. We are looking at, in, in Portugal, evaluation of how we have done, stock taking, how we have done in so far as implementation of SDG 14 is concerned. What are the challenges? What is it that we can be able to share uh, towards implementation and also to look for new commitments. And for Kenya and Portugal, we are saying we should go beyond commitments and talk about action. What actions have been taken to reverse what? What are the challenges? The challenges of marine pollution, marine pollution, particularly the plastics. And I had JR talk about plastics, solid, solid ones. Otherwise, Madam Weinberger, what will we be giving our children and grandchildren? The ocean will soon be turned into a dump site for plastics, while we should be able to give them healthy oceans that we also received from those who are before us. And so I'm saying that Portugal is yet another opportunity for the global community to appreciate that the resource is a common resource that requires concerted efforts by nation states, by regions, and the global community to address. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mayor, can you address a little bit of how we can integrate scientists in diplomatic engagements, and also as a corollary to that, the role of science diplomacy? Yeah, um, I've, I've kind of lived on this fringe for, for some time, and I've seen the remarkable possibilities of the integration. I, yes. I, I get the impression that oftentimes, because scientists have a very different worldview, scientists don't think about borders, they, they, they think about processes, and we think about ocean scientists, we think about a globally connected ocean. We read papers by colleagues in other countries, and we start collaborations because the ocean is so large, and, and the work we have to do is so massive that we, we collaborate, we, we build friendships, we build trust. And so the possibilities, I think, are tremendous. And, and I, I can go back in history and, and, and think about how the first rapprochement between Germany and Israel at the end of the Second World War was really the establishment of something called the Minerva Foundation. And it was a scientific exchange. And it was, again, the, the first starts. And, and I, I, I've sat at forums through International Ocean Drilling Program where many, many, many years ago, before it was common at all, Taiwan and Chinese scientists sat together. And so I think the, 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 the opportunities are, are tremendous, not only from initial, you know, first in establishment of relations, but also sometimes last out. Um, I think about, we think about the current situation. I think uh, in all the circles I deal with, many Arctic circles, many, uh, Research circles, uh, we've certainly cut off relations with Russia right now, but during the Crimea invasion, there were still bilateral or multilateral discussions going on. And so, you know, at, at certain thresholds, we can still maintain an ability to uh, interact. So I think the, the opportunities are tremendous. So I think the challenges come when political issues are raised to such a level that, that even these personal relationships are, are strained because at some point we, we sometimes have to have to draw draw a line and, and, and have a threshold of of acceptance. And I had experience 
from running the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science? Well, first of all, there's a lot more scientific involvement in these issues than meets the eye, uh, number one. I mean, we had lots of scientists in the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science working on all manner of issues, space cooperation, health cooperation, environmental issues, medical. It was the time of the HIV AIDS was sort of a burgeoning as a big issue. But the one lesson I learned that I thought was extremely important was it, it has, there has to be a sort of a parallel process where the scientists and the diplomats work together from the bottom up. It doesn't do any good to have some big diplomatic problem that you got into because of some fight over patents or whatever it is, and then dump that onto the State Department's lap and say, hey, you, uh, we, we, we're past our ability to solve this, you do it now. But if you work together in a sort of symbiotic way from the bottom up, you'd be amazed at the good results you can get uh, from cooperation between scientists and, and diplomats, and really. I, I, I can reiterate that from what we call the Arctic Five meetings that have taken place with respect to Law of the Sea with an Arctic focus that have taken place for 15 years until, mm -hmm. until this year, and this is the first year it's called off. But that is, it's a, it's a bottom up, Right. Scientists and diplomats come together. They discuss things collectively, they discuss things individually, but most importantly, those friendships are established on both sides. Mm -hmm. And should something elevate, an issue elevate, oftentimes it's that personal relationship. That can, and I, I can give, a, again, a personal example of a, a discussion in Japan. It was a negotiation about a poten potential boundary for a continental shelf boundary. And uh, I found myself with the State Department team because I had been working on the, the mapping part of it. And when we came into the negotiating room, sitting across the table from me was, uh, I didn't know who would be on the other side. And it was a colleague I had worked with for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And something very, very contentious came up during the negotiation, during the formal negotiation. But because th this was truly a friend of mine, we were able to offline sort out the issue amongst ourselves, and then that got back to the diplomatic team. And, and so I think, I guess if I could offer advice about, about how to better integrate, I would say as you go on diplomatic missions, see if you find, can find a scientist who's worked with that com country with, and who actually has, knows people in that country and has those personal relationships. And sometimes you can take advantage of that quite easily. So to follow on that, and since you referenced the crisis in Ukraine, are you worried about the loss of those long-term contacts um, with the cutoff um, with Russian scientists? I am. I, I just came back from a meeting a week or two ago in Sweden, where we normally have tremendous Russian participation, and, and there was one small Zoom voice, but that voice was very timid, and so the the concern is even though we, we have trust in those people, the, it's not clear on the other side how, how much freedom they have to participate. And I worry if this carries on for a long time, we'll just lose those relationships totally and we'll have to start from the beginning. Yeah. Um, Ambassador Negroponte, going back to something you raised early about the ideological resistance to UN law of the sea. I mean, having been engaged in this for decades now, do you feel that ideological resistance is less, it's more? What progress have we made? Well, I, I, it hasn't really been tested. No one's surfaced the issue yet uh, for uh, renewed senatorial consideration. And I think that probably it wouldn't be wise to do it until one was a little bit more confident that, that what you just asked was the case, that we wouldn't just run into another buzzsaw because it, 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 there's not much satisfaction <laughs> in raising the issue just to see it shot, shot down once again. I mean, there are people in the Senate who have ideological views on things like this, but whether they'd be persuaded by the other arguments, I don't know. But I think the issue has got to you know percolate for a while and we'll see what will happen. Could I mention one other thing on scientific cooperation? When Ronald Reagan, I mean, he had two phases in the relationship with Russia. One, or with Moscow, with the Soviet Union. One was the evil empire, right? And then there was, 
after uh, the f winter or November or so of 1985, uh, Gorbachev became his friend. He loved G Mr. Gorbachev. You couldn't, you couldn't say anything bad about Mr. Gorbachev after that. I was his deputy national security advisor at the end, and uh, he was always quite defensive. And when he met at the summit in 85 with Gorbachev in Geneva, our bureau managed to get snuck in there as the last point in the communique, joint cooperation on uh, fusion research and the creation of a fusion reactor. And if you've heard of the ITER, I-T-E-R, reactor, I think it's somewhere in France or somewhere in Europe, that was the product of that summit. And it was the last of seven or eight items in the, um, in the communique, all of the others of which were pretty much political stuff. But we managed to ease into that, uh, an area of important scientific cooperation as a way of trying to warm the atmosphere between the two countries. So there are times you can use science and science cooperation as a helpful diplomatic tool. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Mayo, uh, maritime piracy, so in a bright spot of the world, has been on the decline for a number of years now. Um, can you talk about Kenya's experience uh, with that and how it's managed to protect its maritime waters? No, thank, thank you very much. Uh, when we were young, we used to hear that there was piracy in the medieval times. We never thought <laughs> that in our real life, piracy would be a challenge. Um, but from 1994, the Horn of Africa, the west of the Indian Ocean, the Gulf, had challenges of piracy, which uh, were partly made possible by many years of lack of uh, a federal and operating government in Somalia. And so Kenya uh, joined with other countries in the neighborhood to be able to address the challenge of piracy, which made even uh, insurance premiums to go up. Uh, and so Kenya joined the group which we were talking about, the contact group on piracy off the coast of Somalia. And uh, we were active with many Western partners in uh, surveillance and stoppage of uh, the piracy, piracy, pirate activities uh, that went for a long time. And in that regard, Kenya was uh, proactive in uh, making it possible to have suspects uh, be, uh, that could then be tried in our courts. And even the ones that were convicted could be jailed in, in, in our, within our country, in our jails, after, of course, enacting the Merchant Shipping Act. And so we collaborated with many countries and uh, we were able eventually to reduce the piracy incidences to an extent that I think in, from 1917 to date we have not had incidences. And Kenya has been removed from, the Kenyan waters have been removed uh, from uh, the high-risk the high areas as a result of collaborative efforts of the countries in the Horn of Africa and major shipping countries. Uh, it, it made it also very expensive. Instead of using the Suez Canal, a number of countries now are to go through the Cape of Good Hope, uh, which was a much, much longer route uh, because of, uh, of piracy. But I said, yes, in this regard, we deployed our Kenya, defen Kenya Defense Forces, particularly the Kenya Navy, to be able not only to we put surveillance on our territorial waters, but even the EZZ areas, and for a long time was escorting uh, cargo ships uh, from attacks uh, from, from piracy. But we also have subsequently enhanced our Coast Guard services uh, to be able to make sure that um, shipping is not interfered with within our waters and, behind, and beyond. But that is another aspect on diplomacy. We needed others to come on board 
because uh, the larger part is even beyond the EZZs and even the high seas. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Negroponja, the, the South China Sea continues to be perhaps one of the most politicized areas of the world with China increasing its presence there. Um, what do you see as the future? Hmm. Well, the arbitral tribunal several years ago ruled against China and said that they couldn't use the lines that they used to determine um, maritime jurisdiction, but they have been completely dismissive of that. So I, I would say there's a stalemate, but I, I think it's also earned uh, China uh, a considerable antagonism from other member states. The, most of the Southeast Asian countries, most particularly the Philippines and Vietnam, who have some serious marine jurisdictional disputes, but there are other countries as well that have disputes with them. And it doesn't say much about their professed willingness to uphold the norms of the international system. I mean, the law of the sea is the governing law for these issues. It's not some, um, I think, almost fabricated uh, history of a tradition of having this so-called nine-dash line. So I, 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 I don't know. I'm hoping one day that they might come to some kind of a resolution of this question. In the meanwhile, uh, the other effort that's been ongoing over the years has been to try to get at least under these circumstances of stalemate, some kind of code of conduct uh, for the use of the South China Sea, but they've kind of been blocking the way to that as well, in, mainly by politically trying to divide the association of Southeast Asian nation member countries. And so they always manage to find one or two of the 10 to sympathize with their point of view so that we can't, they can't get this code of conduct through, so. You don't uh, sound optimistic. <laughs> well, it's a reality, but I don't, think we, I don't think anybody should concede the point to the Chinese. I think it's just, you know, sometimes international disagreements last for quite a long time, and then uh, at some point, because of a uh, combination of circumstances, they end up getting resolved. So, you know, you might get a Chinese leader who says, well, maybe this, maybe we ought to do it differently somehow. You never know. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mayer, the <clears throat> efforts to create a healthier ocean took center stage when the United Nations proclaimed a decade of ocean science and sustainable development. As the chair for the UN, um, National Com uh, the UN Decade of Ocean Science, could you elaborate on the goals of that? Yeah, I first have to say that as a scientist, it's really quite remarkable to, to hear about a, a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. It, it, it kind of represents uh, recognition at, at the highest levels of government of something that the science community has known for, for some time, that the ocean uh, plays a, a critical and sustaining role in our lives and our livelihoods and our well-being, and it's under great threat. And we, we heard it eloquently presented by PDES, Little John. And so for the science community to, to see that globally world leadership recognizes this is, is, is phenomenally exciting. And so the decade offers a framework for creating, and in their words, it's the, the science we want for the, for the science we need for the ocean we want. Um, and if you take that one step higher, it's uh, the ocean we need for the future we want. And again, we heard, we heard discussion of that a little earlier. What the decade has outlined are a number of challenges, 10, 10 challenges or so. Um, things like uh, a, a uh, beating pollution, what we've heard, what we've heard about um, restoring ecosystems and so on. And then at the end of that, seven outcomes. And that's a healthy ocean. Uh, safe ocean. But the other side of the, of the decade, which is, is really new and unique and important, is it's 
recognition that we have to do science in a different way, particularly ocean science, that, that we've not paid enough attention to indigenous knowledge. We've not paid enough attention to the great understanding that peoples from all over the world have, that how connected they are with the ocean. And so a large portion of the ocean decade really focuses on this way of co-developing the science, ensuring that indigenous peoples are involved in the, not, not just the results, but in the creation of the science, and then ensuring that the results are distributed in a transparent way and an equitable way that all people can share from what's going on. So it's a, it's a wonderful framework. It's a wonderful concept. Like many ocean-related UN issues, there's not much money put towards it by the UN. It really falls upon the, the member states to step up. And again, to hear wonderful words from Peter S. Littlejohn today about the US position now is, is very hopeful that the US will, will do its share. And other countries are. And again, because the oceans are so interconnected, the decade provides this, this overarching framework to let programs and research be done in an interconnected way that will really mean much more than a bunch of little individual programs. Great, thank you. Did we have time for audience questions? Great, so I would like now to turn to the audience if anyone has questions for our panelists. I think they're gonna bring you a... Hi, good afternoon. I'm uh, the Philippine ambassador. I just wanted to ask uh, Ambassador Negroponte, who's very familiar, of course, with the Philippines. Uh, isn't it about time the United States, uh, you mentioned something about the, the Senate uh, ratifying the treaty on the, U the United Nations uh, law of the sea. Could it be the right time to do it now since there is an aggressive behavior coming from China now on, on, on the South China Sea? They've uh, made these reefs into military bases and uh, the Philippines, of course, won that arbitral, the arbitral award. Would be at the right time to do it now since there is this bilateral uh, or a, rather a uh, uh, both parties in the Senate are in agreement that China is a major competitor of the United States? Well, um, Ambassador, it, first of all, it's great to see you again, as always. Um, and uh, I have very fond memories of my time as uh, a representative in your country. Um, I, what can I say? It, in the end, it's up to the Senate, and it's basically going to be up to whether th those 17 votes that I talked about can be found. If they are found, I think the answer to your question is, if, if they are found, it's going to be, I'm sure, one of the elements in the argument that's made successfully for ratification is going to be the changed situation with respect to China as compared to 20 or 30 years ago. So I think definitely uh, the situation with respect to China is going to be a, an element contributing to uh, the possible ratification of the treaty. But None of us can answer for the U.S. Senate, and uh, some, sometimes unpredictable or quirky things happen in the Senate, as you know. The legislative process is not a totally predictable thing, but uh, I think it is to be hoped that China's behavior on these law of the sea issues is a good argument. It's yet another argument, if you will, for ratification of the treaty. Piper Campbell, American University. Um, my question is about, pl about plastics, maritime plastics, and COVID's impact, because it was a problem before, and as J.R. Littlejohn described, plastics can remain in the ocean for up to 500 years. But over the last two years, the, uh, just the extraordinary explosion of single-use plastics in hospitals, but also increased in consumption via Amazon, more takeout. It just seems to me like there's so many new problems compounding the known problem. And so I, my question to the entire panel is, 
are the actions that you've di been discussing, which although they're very positive, are they sufficient to address the burgeoning extent of the problem and also more than anything else to change people's behaviors? Because I note even here at the panel, we have um, plastic water bottles on the table. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> It's a great question. I'll, I'll take a, fir a first shot, and I'm not an expert on this uh, at, at all, but again, I think we heard very encouraging comments about the new UN environmental uh, ENAC 52, is, is, is it, it, what it's called, which is really focusing on, on legally binding uh, legislation for the control of plastics across the board. That's very encouraging. The other side of it is I, I take a look at the BBNJ, the treaty before, which had 10 years of pre-negotiation and is now seven years beyond. And uh, I, I just worry about how long will it take. And, and that's my, my big concern, because this is something that needs immediate action. Are we out of time, Frank? We couldn't Can read. One more question? Oh, we oh. couldn't read your, your oh. sign. Uh, <laughs> and I wasn't even looking. <laughs> we have moderators and panelists who forgot their glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but may I say that um, the challenge of plastics is real, but it falls to a large extent in the realm of voluntary commitments. And so it is important that member states are encouraged stakeholders are encouraged both in the public and private sector to see the effects of plastics. There were commitments over recycling, but in most countries that has not been done well. And so, yes, the question is true. In quite a number of countries now, or a number of countries now, they don't even allow, of course, uh, single use or for bottles, uh, I mean, plastic bottles to be used, but that varies from one country to the other. But we are saying encouragement and the use of science and sharing the knowledge to be able to effectively manage recycling of, of um, plastics is equally important. Thank you. So our prompter told us we have time for one more question. Hi, Mark Haver, Sustainable Ocean Alliance. During our keynote speaker, she mentioned how it is important for intelligence to be somewhat separate from policy in order to establish credibility in intelligence information provided to our national security community. As you've seen with the climate crisis and as you see with our ocean crisis, there definitely is a distance between the information that we've known for decades about ocean and climate health and policy decisions that are made. In fact, we also just heard our speakers on the panel mention the importance for scientists and diplomats to work in a parallel track. I was wondering if you could expand more on uh, how you see science and policy fitting together and the ways in which it's important for them to work together but also see science as nonpartisan and, and, and still credible. Well, I can just quickly give you an example of where there was this tight kind of relationship which was so critical. There's no way that Richard Benedict, who was my deputy when I ran OES and who negotiated the our participation in the Montreal uh, Protocol for the Protection of the Stratospheric Ozone Layer. There's no way he could have done that by himself. Without uh, good scientific knowledge uh, uh, supporting him, he wouldn't have been able to find the solutions. I mean, we worked with the scientists, first of all, uh, to persuade other countries of the merits of the science. The fact that these chlorofluorocarbon molecules were destroying the stratospheric ozone layer, and it had been proven by an experiment by, uh, by a Mexican scientist and uh, an American scientist, and for which they got the Nobel Prize eventually. So, and, and all the key countries in the, in the industrialized world were skeptical of the science, so we sent scientific teams with people from NOAA and uh, <clears throat> other agencies, the EPA and so forth, to 
England, to Brussels, to Japan, I remember these specifically, to the, to the Soviet Union, and we persuaded of them of the science in a, in a, a reasonably short period of time. And uh, that ended up being the basis for the provisions of the Montreal Protocol. Even the president's science advisor didn't believe, this was Ronald Reagan's science advisor, didn't believe the science, uh, and never did. And uh, Don Hodel, the Minister Secretary of Interior, didn't believe it either. They asked him in a press conference, well, what are you going to do about this? And he said, well, buy more sunblock. Uh, and there was a huge cartoon uh, by Herblock in the Washington Post the next day. Um, so, I mean, I thought it was a wonderful example of where science and the policy and the treaty-making function were just inextricably integrated. And our best friends became the scientists from NASA, NASA and NOAA. Those were the two key agencies that, that helped us out in making the case around the world and ultimately carrying the day in Montreal. And I just add a caveat to that, and that is that works. That process works. The, the scientific process is an apolitical one. It, it has a it has a, a process of, of coming to eventually, hopefully, the right answer through review and vetting and things like that. But what it has to be free of is interference. And so in this interchange between diplomats and scientists, you need to let the scientists speak the truth without interference with political motivation because it will be discovered and undermine the effort. Tremendously, and, I, and I'm not, not not saying that happens, but, but but we can't. We have to let the science process. But take signing it. a treaty is a political act, my friend. So you ultimately have to persuade the political leader that you, you signing it ha has merit. And persuade them with good science. Yeah, right. <laughs> we had we had uh, divided government on that, and but Mr. Schultz persuaded Ronald Reagan. He went and had his we he took advantage of his weekly meeting with President Reagan, and he said that he was going to send a delegation up to sign this agreement and that he had uh, the EPA on board and they were, they were key. And uh, Reagan said, okay, if you say so, George. <laughs> I feel like that science versus politics is worthy of its own session, but it's a, great, it's a great way to wrap the discussion. I would like to thank our panelists and our audience. This has been a wonderful discussion and great to have it in person. Mm -hmm.